the best response you can have to a payoff in a thriller is someone goes, oh, right, I forgot, of course, I should have... On Story offers a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. All of our content is recorded live at Austin Film Festival and our year-round events. To view previous episodes, visit onstory.tv. On Story is brought to you in part by the Alice Clayburgh Reynolds Foundation, a Texas family providing innovative funding since 1979. From Austin Film Festival, this is On Story, a look inside the creative process from today's leading writers, creators, and filmmakers. This week's On Story, the award-winning producer behind The Terminator, The Walking Dead, and Aliens, Gail Ann Hurd. I realized my strengths were helping to bring a shared vision to life, and that my job was being a facilitator and uh, a godmother. Sometimes I had to be the drill sergeant. And it was, it was literally wearing a lot of hats. In this episode, Gail Ann Hurd takes audiences through her career, beginning as an assistant for the legendary Roger Corman to working with James Cameron to producing numerous sci-fi classics. In 1978, when I went to work for Roger Corman, it was the one place in town where Roger looked at women as, as having unlimited potential. So I thought I was going in for an interview to be his secretary for life. <laughs> That's the aspirations that we had um, at the time. And in the very first interview, he said to me, um, I, I like practiced my typing and for those of you old enough, shorthand, which most of you probably never heard of. Um, and he didn't ask me about any of that. He said, what do you want to do for the rest of your career? And I said, I, I, I want to produce. Um, I, I realized that <laughs> that was probably the, 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 the best thing for me to do. And, uh, and so under Roger, you did everything. Um, he had women directing, he had women writing, he had women editing, he had women art directors. Uh, so I, I saw a Hollywood that really doesn't even exist now, which is sad, which is a really sad commentary on the fact that this was 1978 and things haven't changed. Um, but uh, for Roger, it was completely equal opportunity, and I actually think he favored women. Um, Mainly because we work for we worked for less. We still work for less, <laughs> and um, we are more tenacious. And and actually, I think and he felt a lot more loyal. Um, so um, so the other thing that that I did for him is we would have to write short uh, plots that could potentially be turned into films because Roger, unlike most producers originated almost every idea that was produced at his company. So all of us in his very small company had to do everything. So we learned how to come up with plots. We learned how to write treatments. We learned how to write and rewrite scripts. We learned how to cast. We learned how to location scout. We learned the post-production process. It really was the best possible film school. me if you want to live. <laughs> Come on! Let's jump a little bit ahead to Terminator because you actually co-wrote Terminator. At the time, especially coming out of that place, is that what encouraged you 
to decide to write this script? Uh, well, Jim, um, I met Jim through uh, working at Roger Corman's because he was building spaceship props uh, in the model department of a movie called Battle Beyond the Stars, which is Roger's homage uh, to Seven Samurai. The initial idea uh, came to Jim when he was very ill and uh, working in, in I believe it was Rome, I know it was Italy, uh, in post-production on Piranha 2, the spawning. <laughs> Probably the one Jim Cameron title you haven't seen, <laughs> Saltwater Piranha That Fly. <laughs> And just as an interesting side note, um, the it, Greek Italian producer Ovidio Asinidis kept trying to fire Jim because he really wanted to direct it himself, um, and Jim just wouldn't wouldn't allow himself to be fired. Um, and then he locked Jim out of the editing room. And this is back when we edited on film, so it's not like a computer where you'd save different versions. And Jim, once again, I wasn't there. But Jim said that he would break into the editing room every night <laughs> and re-edit the film. <laughs> um, but he got very, very sick. And, uh, and in a fever dream, the image of the, you know, sort of anodized endoskeleton of the Terminator emerging from the flames came to him. So our goal was to clothe and, you know, and flesh out uh, the Terminator. Um, and so the, the, the process was really first, um, Jim wrote what he called uh, a scriptment, which is a hybrid of um, a treatment and a script. And it was 48 pages, single space typed, and it had some dialogue in it. Um, and I think if anyone were to ever find that, the finished product um, is very, very close to it. There, there are some things that we realized that we needed, some of the foreshadowing of the future. Um, you know, there's a storm coming. You know, when, uh, when Kyle says, you know, sir, I've crossed time for you. I love you. I always have. And that was one of the things that developed. John Connor gave me a picture of you once. I didn't know why at the time. It's very old, torn, faded. You were young like you are now. You seemed just a little sad. I used to always wonder what you were thinking at that moment. I memorized every line, every curve. I came across time for you, Sarah. I love you. I always have. You needed to see what it was that someone from the future could fall in love with. You know, that, that there was tangible, something tangible. Um, but, you know, you have, to do the, you have to do some revisions for budget. You have to do revisions for locations. You have to do revisions uh, right before we started shooting. Linda Hamilton um, uh, either broke her ankle or, you know, tore the tendons in her ankle, and we had to, she really, you know, couldn't run, so we had to completely reschedule the film um, and, you know, try to remove some of that action for her character. So, you know, it's, it's constantly coming up with plan B, C, D, and E and rewriting as you go. So, you know, can you talk a little bit about that experience of then jumping out of the nest and going over to do this project with Orion, right? And, and how that changed, like how that was well, for well, the Well, first of all, um, thankfully, Roger didn't kick me out too soon because um, it took a couple of years to get Terminator financed. I mean, I'd like to say... We had 99 doors slammed in our faces. And if Roger hadn't convinced us that, um, that the Terminator was good and it was worth pursuing, we would have given up. And we would not have kept knocking. My whole thing is, as a producer, 
pre-production is the time when you really make the movie for the first time. And that's when you identify where your problems might be. So at least you have solutions for that. Like you have a location you absolutely have to have, you know, make sure you've got that. That's gonna that's gonna ruin everything if if you can't pull that off. And um, and I learned that from a, another really important person who basically said, um, you know, in Terminator that uh, that the location at the end of the movie um, there was a there's a big factory that we you know and we ended up shooting I think in a jam and jelly uh, factory <laughs> that it was really important to have that that was the that was the big thing uh, and also obviously a Griffith Park Observatory. Um, and also, we had, as many people do these days, uh, a release date uh, before we even started shooting. So we started shooting Terminator in March 1984, and it came out in October. And that's not, I mean, back then, uh, you know, visual effects, cutting on film, visual effects were not fast. We had stop motion animation, um, and we really had to, to have three or four different units shooting at once in order to, to make that to make that schedule. Hey, Miss, do you even know what's going on? I woke up today in the hospital, and that's all I know. Things got crazy. Man, you won't believe the panic. It first starts with discovering the material. Now, Frank discovered it long before I did. And um, even though we, we've been friends for years, because he and my husband wrote together on the Young Indiana series for George Lucas, yeah. uh, where they both cut their teeth. Um, and so, uh, so Frank had been a personal friend for a long time before we worked together. Um, and uh, one of my executives said, um, have you ever read The Walking Dead? And I said, yeah, and I think I inquired a few years ago. Um, and this, I think, is 2009. Um, and the, I think it it's, was first published in either 2003 or 2004. Um, and the rights aren't available. And he said, well, you know, it's been a while. Uh, why don't we check again? So he checked and found out that Frank Darabont was the last person to have the rights. But he had sent the script around. His agents had sent the script around. And at the time, every network in existence had passed on it. Other important thing to, to, to think about, which is that your timing may be wrong when you have a project, you know? So don't give up on it. Um, and, uh, and I said, well, you know, um, AMC has reached out to us. And he's like, AMC, come on, Mad Men and The Walking Dead. I, I don't see them on the same network. And I said, well, I found out some really interesting data the most successful rating-wise block of programming in the, on AMC is not Mad Men, it's Fear Fest. <laughs> the two weeks of programming of classic horror, science fiction, uh, genre films leading up to Halloween. And they were looking to launch a show, as they said, you know, when they had the eyeballs from that audience on their network. And um, it's like, OK. He said, I am, you know, what do we have to lose? Well, then we found out that um, just before we were going to go in, um, that his option had lapsed. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the good news was that uh, Comic-Con in San Diego was coming up. and. Um, Robert Kirkman, who at the time lived in um, Kentucky, was coming out. We sat down with him. We talked with him, and um, um, and we uh, all agreed to go forward. So that was July. Um, we pitched in October. Uh, they read the script and they said, "Look, this this is we need to, to a slower pace. Uh, we need to burn through less plot in a um, cable series. Uh, so come in with a pitch." We came in a pitch with in October and November. Uh, another script was ordered, and I think in January, February, we had a writers' room, and in um, and in March, we had an order for six episodes. So 
when things moved, it moved incredibly quickly. And then that October, we were, we were on the air in 2010. I love sci-fi, fantasy, and horror. I think it's fantastic. And, um, you know, and, and to this day, I still have press. My apologies to, to those of you who are, who don't have this misperception, who somehow feel that, that women or girls aren't interested or good at it. I think that's changing. Um, I do think that Wonder Woman was a huge, made a huge change. Um, but so did Terminator and Aliens and The Abyss and a lot of the, the films um, that, I've, that I've worked on and, and even The Walking Dead. But, um, but generally between 45 and 50% of the audience for my films and TV series in the science fiction, fantasy, and horror genre are, are women. So it's an important misperception to be corrected Although even after Terminator, an executive at Fox, when I went in to produce Aliens for an interview, said, how can a little girl like you produce a big movie like this? And then I, I basically said, why don't you check my references? So I, you know, I, so I didn't try to bluff my way through it. I basically said, here are the names and numbers. Call these people. One was the head of film finances. One was Roger Corman. Um, you know, another was... Uh, uh, one of the executives at Orion who'd work with me. So I didn't have to always be the person defending myself. Um, you know, as a woman, it's very hard because when you stand up for yourself, you're looked at as a, you're called a, you're called a ball breaker, you're called a lot of tough things that men aren't. And that wasn't that long ago. So I think it's an, another important thing for all the men in the room to really think about when you're interacting with women, are you treating them differently? And make sure that you're not dealing, you're not bringing your, um, the, the socio-cultural um, um, misperceptions that we have about women into your dealings with, with them. You've been watching a conversation with Gail Ann Hurd on On Story. Next up, filmmaker Jason Newlander and his short film, Buttercup. Hi, my name is Jason Newlander, and I wrote and directed the short film Buttercup. I was looking for a project to make with my daughter, Scarlett. Uh, and one evening, a friend of mine was babysitting her for the first time. And just as my wife and I were leaving the house, she asked if there were any bedtime rituals I, she needed to know about. And I was like, oh my God, that's the film. I had so much fun working with my daughter, Scarlett. Even though she had never done anything like this before, she's just a naturally theatrical kid. When the set got changed over for the ending, she came down from a bedroom upstairs that was her dressing room, and she looked around and she goes, Daddy, this is, this is kind of creepy. And I was like, yeah, it's a little bit creepy. Oh, because I hadn't told her the ending. And she goes, is my character creepy? And I was like, yeah, your character's a little creepy. And she goes, I don't want to be creepy. <laughs> the two short films that I've made so far both are um, horror movies, but they, I think, both exper are experimenting in a similar way with building tension. Specific to Buttercup, what I wanted to do was really focus, actually, believe it or not, on the acting. In some ways, like as far as the directing of it goes, particularly on set, it was very much not about creating a scary environment, but finding the most natural way to deliver the material and the funniest way to deliver the material as well, knowing that we would create the scary in post. All right, coming up is my short film, Buttercup. Thanks so much for watching. Bedtime is 8.30. 8.30, got it. Ah. Sheila, stop it. We have to go. Hey, Sheila. I'm Emmy. Do you like to draw? <gasps> <laughs> they said you were good, but... <laughs> you ready? <laughs> oh, wait, one thing. Are there any bedtime rituals I should know about? Sheila will run you through them. Call if there's a problem. Say hi to Buttercup for us. I 
What you drawing? Mm -hmm. Buttercup. Can I see? For Halloween, huh? You can keep it. Thanks. What game do you want to play? <gasps> What you doing? <laughs> wow, those are some really good knots. Where'd you learn that? Buttercup taught me. Bedtime! Untie me, please. Sheila! <laughs> hey, stop. It's time to get ready for bed. I know! Sheila! <laughs> Sheila! What? You need to listen to me. I am. Then what are you doing? Duh, bedtime ritual, silly. Are there any bedtime rituals I should know about? Sheila will walk you through them. Don't you have to brush your teeth or something? Oh, yeah!
On Story is part of a growing number of programs in Austin Film Festival's On Story Project, including the On Story PBS series, now streaming online, the On Story radio program and podcast in collaboration with Public Radio International, and the On Story book series available on Amazon. To find out more about On Story and Austin Film Festival, visit onstory.tv or austinfilmfestival.com.